All right, welcome to the second day of level one models. And today we're going to talk about alternatives to the canonical HRF. So if you don't know what I just said, canonical HRF, if you don't know what that means, then please go back and revisit the canonical HRF lecture. So last time we discussed this canonical HRF and basically it's an assumed uh, bold response to an isolated stimulus. And last time we created the regressors by convolving a canonical HRF with the expected neuronal response, which is determined by when the stimuli are presented. So assumptions of the canonical HRF are that it has a specific width, a specific time to peak, and then there are other parameters, like the parameters that um, explain this post-stimulus undershoot. And the only free parameter when we use HRF convolution is the height. So the beta in our regression model is what we have to multiply the, this height by to match the height of the bold aggregation. So we're kind of assuming everything's correct. And obviously you can imagine situations where if this time to peak was wrong, the height will be wrong because this peak won't be lining up with the peak of the, uh, the bold HRF. We actually saw that before we used convolution. In the last lecture, when we just used the box car, it couldn't meet with the peak of the signal very well. And when we applied convolution, it met with the peak better. So um, there are ways to actually estimate these three parameters separately. This Link, Linquist and Wager paper from 2007 looks into different approaches for doing that, but that I'm not going to discuss. Just thought I would mention the paper if that was something you're interested in trying. Instead, we're gonna talk about the finite impulse response model. So there are actually a couple of different highly related ways of doing this, but I'm going to present the simplest model which I call FIR. There is another variation of this called uh, in the Ashby book, which um, it's actually a pretty good book. It has a lot of MATLAB code in it by uh, Greg Ashby. I forget the title, but if you just look for an fMRI analysis book by him, um, he calls it FBR. And it's a very slight important difference. But anyway, I'm not going to talk about the FBR model, but I will talk about the FIR model. So here's our time course, as I showed last time, tipped on its side. So time equals zeros at the top, time increases as we go down. So this is our dependent variable in the model. So now previously our design matrix had a column of ones and then our regressor for the stimulus, which was the uh, convolved um, regressor. But now what we're doing is for this paradigm, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten stimuli. Each of these regressors is zero where it's black and it's one where it's white. And basically, the first regressor is picking up the first time point, or actually, it's the TR prior to the trial onset for each of the ten trials. So you can think of this as binning the data. Um, so just uh, taking the average bold activation magnitude for the TR prior to the stimulus onset. The second regressor is then taking the um, second TR, so this, which is the TR during the onset, and so on and so forth. So you can think of this if you're, if, as a type of, it's almost like um, the cell means approach for an ANOVA model where we're modeling uh, TRs relative to the onset time. So then our betas correspond to the average signal in these different time bins, and you can plot the betas directly, and you get this plot I'm showing on the right, which is just the average response to the stimulus. So the beta estimates are what are plotted here, just to be clear. So this model is great because it makes no assumption about the shape of the HRF but you can see it's pretty noisy and that's the trade-off. So going back to the terminology we learned in the first of the series, this is a fine example of a bias variance trade-off. Using a canonical HRF is biased because we have a very specific shape that we're assuming, but the variance is really low, meaning the predicted bold uh, time course is very smooth. Here it's unbiased because the shape can be anything it wants, but it's highly variable because we end up with a wiggly response. There aren't a lot of data points going into each estimate. In this case, only 10 TRs of noisy bold data uh, go into each time point average. 
So there's kind of a middle ground. So if one end of the spectrum is high bias, low variance, and the other one is low bias, high variance, this constrained basis set is in the middle. So you lower the number of regressors in the model. So back here we had, I don't know, 12 or 13. So we're gonna decrease that. That'll help with the variance issue, but we're going to allow flexibility in the shape by using um, wiggly regressors that look like HRFs. So they, they're HRFE. Um, so here's some examples of, of a constrained basis set. So on the left, we have the basis function. So this is four basis functions. And on the right, I've taken various linear combinations of these. So just multiplying them by numbers and summing them. And you can see the results are things that look like HRFs. But since there's such a variety here, you can it allows things like small shifts in the HRF shape, um, different shapes of the post-stimulus undershoot, things like that. So this is the middle ground. If you use FSL, they have this GUI, it's called FLOBS, that you can use to generate the, the basis sets. And here's a comparison. So this will illustrate the bias variance trade-off pretty well. The blue is the canonical HRF, the double gamma, fitted to the time courses, or fitted to the data. The green is the FIR model, and the red is the basis function, the, um, I'm sorry, the constrained basis functions. So you can see the bias. So the double gamma had a very specific assumption about when this peak would occur, and clearly the peak is actually a little bit later, so it's missing that. And because of that, it's a little bit small. Then the variance trade-off, you can see the green has the highest variance and it's the most wiggly, and the red is in the middle, so it has the least bias and the least variance. But uh, looks good, right? But then what do you do when you have more than one parameter? So the double gamma yields a single parameter. The basis function approach will have as many parameters as basis functions, so four to whatever, five, and the FIR will have one for each time bin, so that could be up to 12. So the advantages of the canonical HRF are that the analysis is much simpler. All we have is a single parameter that we've estimated for each subject. We then average it over subjects or run our group analysis using this parameter. It's really easy to interpret. It's a magnitude of fold activation, and so it simplifies things. The disadvantages are it can be biased. If the shape of the HRF is wrong, it's not fitting the data as best as it could. The unbiased basis sets have the advantage of not having a particular shape. Um, if you do use something like that paper I referenced earlier, the Wager and Lindquist, actually how that works is it uses a time course estimate similar to the red or green, and then it, it estimates the width, the height, and the time to peak from that estimate. So, you know, you could estimate these separate parameters that uh, characterize the HRF. The disadvantages are it's less powerful because it's noisier. The group analyses are difficult because now you have multiple parameters that describe the bold activation. So it's not clear how to combine those. And um, one thing that definitely happens is it's so flexible, it starts fitting the noise in the data and you get these weird things. So that's it. Um, just FYI, most people use the canonical HRF. There are approaches that try to optimize the proper HRF and then use it, but you, know, you have to be careful that you're still not overfitting the data. And I won't talk about those. If you find a paper about it that you would like me to present, I could do that. I'm sure Martin Lindquist has a paper on that, and his papers are generally really, really good. And he does some online lectures, too. So he's a really good teacher. He's a statistician. I forget where he's at now. But anyway, um, right. Make sure you understand the trade-off between the FIR model and the canonical HRF. And know why we mostly use the canonical HRF convolution to create our regressors. So why do we do that? That's it. A little shorter today makes up for the longer one last time. So... Enjoy the rest of your day, and I will talk to you next time.